Welcome to Strategy Talk, where the editors of Strategy Page discuss current events with a splash of history. I'm Dan Masterson, host of Strategy Talk. With me today is the editor of Strategy Page, well-known military author and game designer, Jim Dunnigan. Also joining us is the associate editor of Strategy Page, columnist and author, Austin Bay. Welcome, Austin and Jim. Thought we'd talk a little bit about Russia. We haven't visited them in some time. Jim, Russia isn't doing so well, are they? No, they're not. Uh, Putin is uh, basically paddling as fast as he can to make it sound otherwise, but he's got demonstrations. He's got, uh, well, he's got more opposition at the top. Uh, now, this hasn't really come out much yet because they control the, uh, you know, the, the mass media in Russia. Uh, but there have been rumblings, as it were, chatter. Uh, that some of his economic advisors, who have been basically on his case for you know over a year now, um, that you know Russia is slowly sliding into the abyss. Uh, they've uh, cut their military budget, which is he said they would never do. Uh, the uh, the poverty rate is increasing. That got out. Uh, he's got. Um, He's got economic problems, and he's got no solution for them. He says eventually they'll work their way out. What didn't help, of course, was the uh, the COVID-19. Uh, that hurt everybody. But it probably hurt Russia more because their economy was in bad shape to begin with, and this hasn't helped it. Now, he's trying, for example, to make a, more of an alliance with Iran, which sounds like a losing play at the moment uh, because Iran is in worse shape than Russia. Uh, but he's running out of allies. Turkey, which was technically his ally, uh, they're actually facing off in Libya. Uh, now, the latest <laughs> Turkish insult is Turkey has sent some of its uh, very reliable Syrian Arab mercenaries, which are have been used uh, liberally in northern Syria and Libya. Now they're in Azerbaijan. Uh, on the 27th, another war broke out between Armenia and and Azerbaijan. Now, in the past, the major weakness of much richer and more populous Azerbaijan was the poor fighting quality of their troops. Uh, they have more, you know, gadgets, some of which they bought from Israel. Um, and uh, their weapons are superior. But when it comes, when it gets up close and personal, which it ultimately has to do since they're fighting over uh, real estate, uh, the Azerbaijanis can't cut it. Well, now they're using these Syrian mercenaries. Now, that may be embarrassing to the Azerbaijanis, but at this point, a win is a win. And they're willing to go the Turkish route. Now, the Azerbaijanis are Turks, uh, not Turkey Turks, but Turks nonetheless. Uh, and uh, I, I, one reason for Russia sticking its neck out in Azerbaijan is about half of Azerbaijan is on Iran. At one time, Iran had all of it, but the, the Tsar took it away. And the Soviets wouldn't let it go. Uh, after World War II, the Russians and Soviets tried to take the missing part of Azerbaijan back. The West got in the way. They didn't have the bomb yet. So that was the end of that. Uh, so Russia, Russia and Turkey are in a pickle because now, again, they're fighting each other. In, in 2016, uh, Russia and Armenia signed a military pact. Now, Armenia had always been the faithful little Christian brother, so to speak, of Russia in the Balkans. Uh, they were in the southernmost part of the Balkans. And uh, not the Balkans, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Caucasus. I get my hotspots mixed up sometimes. And uh, the, uh, there are only two Christian uh, enclaves, so to speak, in the Caucasus. Georgia, which is not on good terms with Russia, and Armenia which normally would not be, but they are because they need protection. Armenia is basically uh, a trap between the largely Muslim population of the Caucasus, including Chechnya, um, and Turkey. Uh, and, of course, the Armenians are, are not happy with the Turks, never have been, especially after that, that massacre during World War I, uh, which the Turks are still very touchy about. Uh, but the Armenians haven't forgotten no matter where they are. Um, and, of course, now... Uh, Turkey is again killing Armenians uh, using Arab mercenaries, adding insult to injury. I mean, there's no 
as far as the Armenians concern, are concerned, there's no depravity the Turks won't stoop to to mess over the Armenians. And the Russians, they have a treaty with Armenia, and they are behind it. Uh, so we have another Turkey Armenian uh, our Russian war in the offing. That's something Russia cannot afford. Uh, they can afford. They can, you know, uh, make uh, Azerbaijan more of an ally, but that's all changed in the in the big picture. Uh, Turkey was their ace in the hole. They sold them a billion dollars worth of uh, S four hundred anti aircraft systems, which I believe haven't been turned on yet. Um, and the uh, that was against that. That's going to get Turkey thrown out of uh, NATO at one point or another because we were, we were vociferously against the S four S four hundred because uh, uh, NATO would not integrate the Turkish system into the NATO air defense system, which is part of the point behind NATO, an integrated defense system. Uh, so, and Turkey is, you know, basically nobody's friend, as it turns out, including Russia and Iran, for that matter. Um, so, you know, Russia, if you look at it from Russia's point of view, they have few friends and not the right ones. Uh, and it's not getting any better with this Azerbaijan-Armenia you know, fight over in the Garner Korabakh. Uh, Jim, let me let me pick up on it real quick on a, a, a point though about you say Russia can't afford a war, nor can the Turks, and uh, your, your analysis of, of where the Turks are. The Turks said, you know, who, "Who are the who, who are, Not to get off of Russia, but uh, they they really have no friends either, other than Armenia and kind of sort of with uh, with Georgia and with a a few uh, Turkmen groups. And uh, smaller uh, ethnic groups scattered in the Levant. So they've uh, they've gone that route, and they can't. Uh, they really can't afford to tangle with the Russians either. So uh, just make that it's it's not uh, an extraneous point. And that's true because if they did uh, basically go to war with the Russians, that would not invoke the mutual defense clause of the NATO treaty. And that's it, would not, it would not invoke Article 5. You're absolutely exactly. right. Exactly. And that's been pointed out to them quite bluntly. Uh, you guys get involved in some war that's got nothing to do with the fence, and you're on your own. Uh, but again, like I say, the, the Turks are very clever. They're not going to fight the Russians directly. Uh, they're going to send in their Syrian uh, mercenaries. Now, these Syrian mercenaries are a very interesting thing. I don't know if we've discussed them very much. They, are, they were originally recruited with the help of the United States from secular Syrians who wanted a democracy in Syria. They're not likely to get that either. But anyway, uh, the Turks basically wooed them uh, because many of them, they, they recruited them from uh, inside, of, uh, inside of Syria, but mainly from exile populations. These are Sunni, <coughs> Sunni Muslims uh, who are not in any way, shape, or form in, uh, you know, interested in Islamic radicalism or Islamic terrorism. And the Turks gave them an offer they couldn't refuse. They said, look, you uh, allow us to recruit and train you. We'll pay you well. And as a bonus, if you serve well on your contracts, and these contracts are like six months at a time. So they're not, they're not, they're not, you know, uh, Mamluks, you know, they're not, uh, they're not Janissaries. They're not the old slave, you know, soldiers the Turks had centuries ago. Uh, they have been allowed their freedom. Now, a lot of them have gotten out. Their contract's up. They say, oh, I got my money. But the kicker is, eventually, their families get residency permits in Turkey. Now, the families are already there as refugees. Uh, and basically, I think the ones who get killed in action, aside from the death benefits, one of them is their family is given their, their you know, the right to stay uh, and mourn in Turkey rather than going back to Syria and facing the wrath of uh, Mr. Assad. Uh, so the Turks, again, they're not stupid. Uh, they act crazy at times, especially with this Islamic government they've got. Uh, but they haven't lost their cleverness and, and common sense when the chips are down. So, yeah, they're sending these uh, these mercenaries up to uh, Azerbaijan, um, although the, 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 the mercenaries uh, are not too happy about some of the fights the Russians, have, the, uh, the Turks have sent them into. Uh, they fought the Kurds. They don't like fighting Kurds. Kurds fight back. Uh, and they, they took losses. So that basically the, the Turks had to pull back. Uh, the Turks had all sorts of offensive plans. But once their mercenaries, you know, came up against the Kurds, 
and realize these guys are not, you know, serious Assad's people. Uh, they are serious fighters, and uh, and it, and you know we're basically going to get killed. Uh, they sent them down to Libya, where they had a little easier time, but not by much because they quickly found out that the, uh, the majority of the Libyan people saw the Turks as a return of the Turkish Empire for a long time, for centuries. Uh, Libya was part of the Ottoman Empire, and that memory uh, is not looked upon with any fondness. Uh, but again, most of them, they serve their contracts, and they don't re-up for any more service in uh, Libya. They get a bonus for serving in Libya. They're probably getting that same bonus, or maybe more, uh, to fight the Armenians. They know about the Armenians' reputation, uh, so they know they're, they're in for a fight there. So the Turks have to be careful. They've got military advisors. They always send their own, you know, Turkish officers along as military advisors, not just to, you know, supervise things, so to speak, but to make sure the uh, the people they're lending the mercenaries to do not get them killed needlessly, and the and that maintains morale among the mercenaries. They say, yeah, we're doing the Turks fighting for them, but they got officers here. Sometimes they get they get in the midst of it and they get killed. Uh, so it's like the Gurkhas. You know, they'll die for you, but only if they feel that they're being well treated and well laid, et cetera, et cetera. So you might say the, the Syrian Arab mercenaries are the Turkish Gurkhas. Uh, not quite as good as the Gurkhas, but good enough uh, given the neighborhood they're in. But again, the Armenians, they're tough people. Um, and uh, uh, whether or not the, the Turkish mercenaries will be enough to turn the tide, as it were, this time around, remains to be seen, especially since Russia is adamant that this does not happen. Uh, and, of course, the Armenians are not willing to be, you know, cannon fodder for the Russians either. So they're depending on Mother Russia to use her diplomatic and other clout, maybe a nuclear, you know, threat here and there, uh, to get the, uh, you know, the Azerbaijanis to, uh, to pull back. So... Uh, I'm sorry. So, so, so they're uh, they're involved in. Uh, they may be involved in Armenia, Russia. Oh, they're they, definitely there. They're definitely there. Okay. They have a treaty, and they have troops stationed there. All right. Vision, I think, is stationed there. Wow. Well. They basically border guard, et cetera, et cetera, regime maintenance. Although Armenia hasn't got that much of an internal political problems because they're surrounded by enemies, right. and that tends to unify you. Yeah, and one thing that we need to uh, we we you mentioned it, and it was uh, implied, but Armenia is uh, Christian. Yes, that's important. <laughs> right, uh, it's one of the older uh, continuously Christian countries in the world. They trace they trace uh, their uh, first. Uh, conversions uh, to Christianity, some of them back to the late first century AD, but definitely uh, Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're right up there with the Ethiopians. There. The Ethiopians yeah. and the Armenians have one thing in common. They're among the oldest continuous you know, Christian community uh, in the world and both of them are surrounded by Muslims. Well, there's some in, in, in Syria too. As a matter of fact, some of the people who were in the Free Syrian Army, which is what you were talking about, was yeah. originally who the Turks uh, were re recruiting from, were oh, yeah. from uh, uh, Christian sects and Druze. They yeah, were, they, in, they they were predominantly they uh, thing, moderate Sunni Muslims. So, yeah, one yeah. thing they could depend upon with the Free Syrian Army, which is now the the Syrian, uh, the Turkish mercenary force, uh, is that the uh, being secular, they didn't make a big deal about religion. So as Austin pointed out, uh, the Free Syrian Army, we have, you know, Druze who are basically anathema <laughs> Muslims. They're, they're basically Muslims who basically pretend to be Muslims, but they hang on to a lot of the old religions, you know, predating Christianity or contemporaneous with Judaism. Um, and they are they are hated. They're the, they're the only Arab. Well, they, yeah, I think, yeah, the only Arab uh, community in Israel that is uh, conscripted. And that's because they realize if the Jews go down, we go down with them. Uh, and so the Free Syrian Army, they, they have a lot of people who basically saw that. They say, look, Israel makes it work. Uh, Lebanon tried to make it work until the Iranians got involved. Uh, there are many countries where you have, in that part of the world, where you have uh, different religious uh, and ethnic communities you know, living together in relative peace. But it's not, it's not easy. You know, the, the Swiss were among the first to do it. They did it quite well. But again, they were surrounded by enemies. The Belgians tried to do it. Eh, they had their ups and downs. Uh, 
but again, it's rare. Look at Canada, you know. So you know, it, it's not easy. That is multiculturalism is is poison. Like, right. Dan, so I wanna, I'm sorry. Easy. I was. I want to get back to, to the some of the larger issues that are absolutely crushing uh, Russia. Right. If if I could on, on this land. Yeah, I I was going to ask you, Austin, about East Ukraine. Well, let me let me break this down though. That Jim has written a lot about this over the last uh, let's let's be fair about it. Six years from a, the, really what was kind of an oil and gas high, uh, maybe uh, maybe it's twenty thirteen. So that'd be yeah, that's when it seven se- seven years to, just to get the price point on it. But the fracking has really hurt uh, the. Uh, Putin oligarch regime as much as anything else in the world. And I'm talking about North American fracking, where it's, you know, U.S. and uh, Canada, and it's starting to creep into Mexico now, or at least the Mexicans would love to have it with some of the uh, tight natural gas uh, that, that they've got. And that, uh, and, you, and you also have, it works in the, the politics on this. Poland's demand in 2014. They made it clear to the Obama administration, we want a liquefied na- uh, natural gas uh, port uh, uh, on, on, on the Baltic so we can bring in Canadian and uh, American uh, LNG and not have to rely on the Russians and have them use their e- economic, their energy weapon uh, 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 against us. But the, the big point on this is that <clears> – <throat> The loss of income has really hurt Russian military forces. It has reduced, has not eliminated, but has reduced uh, the Kremlin's ability to project power in almost every single dimension except information. You know, they can still talk it. They can still uh, meddle and muddle in somebody else's elections, and they can still lie, 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 as they do all the time, in hopes of uh, undermining the will of a uh, 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 of an adversary, but they've lost a lot of money there. This also works into what's going on in the Eastern Mediterranean too. It's it's not directly tied to uh, to Putin and, and the oligarchs, but the one of the issues that has alienated Turkey is the fight over where are our Mediterranean sea boundaries since. Uh, the, the Israelis first in a consortium to, I think it had a, a French company in it, and I'll forget what the other company w- 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 was as well, uh, discovered that Leviathan natural gas field, or realized it was is a Leviathan, uh, in Israeli and Egyptian, and slightly in uh, uh, Lebanese, whatever Lebanon is, and Cypriot, at least Greek Cypriot, the southern, the Greek part of the island, uh, uh, waters. It, it, it's huge. Egypt's discovered other uh, gas fields in uh, in its uh, EEZ. So now there is a big tussle over where are the exclusive economic zones, in part because of the way all these Greek-held islands that are you – know, you know, a couple of them are within a mile, mile and a half of the Turkish coast. And depending on how you read uh, the uh, UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, 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 unclose. Uh, yeah, even those little islets would have uh, 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 EEZ. Uh, the big deal is, is that there's natural gas out there that cuts the ability not only out of the Kremlin, but also the Ayatollah regime in Tehran to use their uh, their energy weapon. And the uh, Israelis, the Egyptians, the Egyptians want to use the gas themselves because of for their population. And, and, and uh, they they've made this, you know, this this is going on below the headline level of uh, of uh, media coverage. But it is being covered. They, they say, hey. We, we will be able to produce it ourselves and not rely on Gulf Arab uh, uh, regimes. And it's also going to be uh, uh, closer to us. And maybe we'll make some money out of export uh, as well. All of this 
even the smatterings that uh, the uh, Lebanese may or may not have. And, and I should say the Palestinians, because Gaza has its own uh, uh, cut of the EEZ down in that, uh, in that zone, and there's a, a gas field with, uh, uh, within it. All this begins to blunt what the Kremlin wants to do and what Tehran and Kremlin has done and what uh, Tehran does. Uh, it brings Turkey into conflict with uh, these uh, 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 with its na- uh, with its neighbors. Uh, this is a place where the Russians would like to see that conflict, in my opinion, because it keeps the, the slows down the, the, the development. But the development could even include, um, I think it's an old. 1,200 kilometer, is, uh, that may be right, uh, line running from essentially uh, the uh, Israeli coast and then from North, uh, North Africa in, uh, in, uh, into the Balkans, probably Greece, and then going on up and connecting uh, through, uh, through the Balkans to uh, uh, gas transmission lines going into, uh, into Europe, into Central Europe, even, even Western Europe. Uh, Part of negotiations, too, is that the Turks want to have a big line themselves, but they have uh, that puts Turkey (laughs) against the Russians again. But the Turks were uh, talking about selling, you know, Central Asian gas from Azerbaijan or or uh, uh, Iran. Now, big deal for, for Russia, though, and and Putin and the oligarchs is they don't have the cash. On top of that, they're paying. Now, this is I'm switching to point two, because, but I think point one is, is is the big one. Crimea and Ukraine were outright uh, imperialist territorial uh, grabs by by the Kremlin. That's hurt them definitely on internationally in Western Europe to some degree, but on their central front, and that central front is now well, Romania, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, Poland. And uh, uh, the 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 Balts, three Baltic nations, and Nordics, the northern northern front. Uh, I've written a couple of columns about this, but this is something we've covered uh, in in, uh, in several places, in, including some of it in, in uh, the how to make war, uh, because of the implications of Finland and and and, Sw- and Sweden, both they're, they're already de facto military members. Uh, of the U.S., and that has uh, had uh, th- that is not lost on the uh, uh, Russians themselves. Who brought this about? That even the Swedes uh, are uh, have a, a faction within Sweden that says, "Let's just go ahead and admit it that our air force and ground forces uh, cooperate uh, with Norway and Denmark, and oh my goodness, with uh, the the rest of of NATO's at least air control." Uh, 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 comp- uh, co- uh, components, and then the, the Finns of uh, they've had exercises. We had a huge one. What was it called? Trident Juncture, I believe it was, uh, <clears throat> in in Finland that, that involved uh, U.S. troops, British troops, uh, as well as Norwegians, and uh, it was a defense exercise uh, of, of Finland. So they're paying for that. Now here's the other critical. Uh, hot spot for the Kremlin on the central front, and that's Belarus, who had been <laughs> one of the, uh, like uh, a, a Russia's remaining uh, Eastern European uh, satellite. What you've got going on there, Dan, is uh, an anti-authoritarian revolt by people who are connected enough to the information and political uh, ambiance of of Eastern Europe and, and really the, the, the whole of Europe, they get, they get, uh, uh, internet feeds and, and, and the like, despite Russian attempts to shut it all down, they can't shut it down coming from Ukraine, coming from Poland, coming from the Baltic, uh, Baltic nations. And they're fed up with the fact that, uh, they've nominally been, uh, an independent country from the Soviet, after the point of the Soviet uh, breakup, but the, the, the current di- uh, dictator, Lukashenko, I think is how you pronounce his name, he's been in charge since 1994, and he's done nothing except run a Soviet-style regime. And the Russians, the, let's talk about information warfare w- w- working. Russian people see that going on. The G- Kremlin can't hide that. 
that undermines a lot of the uh, uh, bravado. And that's an, uh, the, uh, and will is not the way it is portrayed by Putin. They're not on this iron uh, iron will to a, a exert the, the, the defense of the mother Russian state because there's so many. Uh, it's so crooked, among other things. And it still has some of the, uh, call them archaic features, but the classic features, I would say archaic uh, uh, communist uh, features, they really are, but they're features that you get with a totalitarian state. So I, I hear I, I really hadn't gotten into the army. Jim and I actually, didn't we talk about that three or four months ago? Where the, I like Jim is the one to, to talk about where the Russian mil military has been going. Yeah. Uh, he's already, they had, to, they had to cut their budgets. And they've had to slow down this modernization uh, modernization process. Yet at the same time, look the way Putin tries to uh, cover up for that. Look at our hypersonic missiles. Why we've got a nuclear powered missile that can go around the world and you know hit the United States and 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 <clears throat> and, and, and the, uh, the like. He's he tries to stage uh, in, information extravaganzas to, uh, assure everyone that, you know, Russia's biceps are big. Well, nobody said that you don't have, uh, uh mil military power, <clears throat> but it is not the modernization program that, uh, the Kremlin wanted, uh, when it started really moving towards it in 2005 and 2006, they thought they were going to have the oil, uh, you know, dominate the oil market. Right. It so, let, let's have Jim comment on the military for a second. Jim, there's they've got major problems with their Navy. Uh, they can't build new ships, which we can't do either. But but they can't even maintain their old fleet. And uh, what they had put into mothballs will never be bought, brought back again. Their military infrastructure continues to deteriorate. Uh, their air force is having problems getting new planes fielded. That's one thing that we can do. We're, we're able to field new aircraft. Uh, and their space program is, uh, uh was at the top, but now with SpaceX and other things, uh, they're not going to get the customers that they used to have. No, they're falling into the third place behind China, uh, in terms of, you know, commercial, uh, you know, space programs, uh, the military space programs aren't much better off. the the uh, The Russian military is has become, as Austin points out, you know, more of an illusion. You know, uh, Potemkin. You know, uh, Count Potemkin lives. Uh, he's trying to throw up a smoke screen to basically uh, make the the Russian bear, you know, look more uh, larger and muscular than he actually is. Um, they do have a lot of the advanced technology, but a lot of it, for example, doesn't work. Uh, the pay, uh, you know, classic example was their uh, their self fighter, the uh, the Su fifty seven, which is in basically in development hell, as they say in Hollywood, uh, not likely to get out. Uh, the Chinese, for example, finally solved the problems with their J twenty, uh, their J twenty, which is basically their version of the uh, uh, the F American F twenty two, uh, and it is it is basically you know a pale shadow of the of the F twenty two, but it is stealthy. Has got all the characteristics. It does cost over a hundred million dollars each. Um, and finally, they they started you know uh, uh, mass producing them, uh, something they'd stalled in nineteen twenty eighteen. They said it entered service in twenty seventeen. They started producing them, and then they realized they had a lot of serious problems. They stopped. Now they've got the J twenty B, which has got a lot of changes. Including uh, Chinese engines, powerful engines, the uh, WS-15, uh, which is which the uh, which the um, Chinese uh, J-20 was designed for. Uh, again, there are still unanswered questions. How reliable will the WS-15 be? Uh, they inherited a lot of their uh, their engine uh, design and production technology from the Russians. They actually licensed some of it for the smaller engines. Uh, but they're finding out that they, the Chinese, don't want to master Russian technology. They want to master uh, Western technology. Uh, and just stealing the tech secrets via the Internet isn't enough. Uh, they've got a labor shortage, uh, getting enough people for, you know, the uh, basically first class technicians. You know, yeah, that, that's one of the things that's, that's rarely mentioned is that they have a dwindling population since they lost all their Muslim satellite nations 
Yes, and the muscles I do have account for most of the population, you know, the not population growth, but, you know, the no births and what have you. Uh, and the problem with the Slavic population is they're demoralized. Uh, who wouldn't be? I mean, it wasn't bad enough. They had 70, 70 years of communism. Uh, they had a, a bright spot, as it were. The 1990s were, were, a, were, were a dark ages because the Soviet Union went bankrupt, literally, uh, and the economy was in a huge mess, uh, which we didn't find out about until they basically got rid of the communists. The Soviet Union fell apart, and they opened up, actually, literally, uh, for a few years in the early 90s, it was it was amazing the things they found out, you know, which American, you know, uh, officials were actually communist spies. A lot of them were, you know, and um, so McCarthy wasn't 100 percent right, wrong, maybe 90 percent. Uh, and uh, the uh, the problem it showed, it revealed was how bad off the Russian infrastructure and economy was. Now, they adopted a lot of Western procedures. They were able to import. Uh, they still had their <clears throat> their oil and gas exports. They were able to buy freely of uh, a Western oil field technology. That saved their bacon because a lot of their oil fields were going out of action because they simply didn't have the technology that the West had to keep all the oil fields pumping. Uh, they uh, they used that uh, profitably throughout the 90s. Putin comes along and, and he cleans up a lot of the corrupt government practices. Suddenly the old timers are getting the pensions, uh, roads are being built, <coughs> the economy was growing. More children were being born among the Slavic population. People saw there was hope. The poverty level, you know, plummeted, which, you know, had, had grown a lot uh, during the later the stages of the communist uh, rule and kept growing uh, during the 90s. Uh, but then Putin decided he needed an external enemy and said, oh, we're at war with NATO or NATO's at war with us. We're defending ourselves. And he invaded Ukraine. And that's what brought him down. He grabbed the Crimea uh, because he said that's always been Russian, but that's neither here nor there. They, he had signed a treaty. Uh, it was signed by the United States, Ukraine and Russia in 1994, 95, whatever it was. Uh, Ukraine agreed to surrender its nukes. It had a bunch of uh, ballistic missiles with and and, a, and a, a stockpile of nuclear weapons with the with the action codes. <laughs> so they were a nuclear power for a few years in the 1990s. Uh, Russian uh, there were economic you know uh, incentives from the United States, which was largely squandered by the still corrupt you know Ukrainian bureaucracy. I mean, they, where are they going to get bureaucrats? They're all going to be former. You know, communist state. It wasn't as bad as Belarus, but it was pretty bad. Uh, but the Russians solemnly uh, praised, uh, promised uh, as part of that treaty uh, to always respect the territorial integrity of Ukraine. That was, what, that was that was called the I think the Budapest uh, uh, Accord, wasn't it? Today? Right, whatever. But anyway, it, it, yeah. it, it got the nukes out of Ukraine. And got Russia to promise they would no longer, because even then, Crimea was always a contentious issue, because that's where the uh, Russians, uh, that was their main base, Sevastopol, for their uh, their Black Sea fleet. Uh, so Ukraine said, all right, we'll lease Sevastopol for you, to you. The Russians didn't really like that. Uh, and Putin used the, you know, the basically the smoldering uh, resentment among many Russians about, you know, Crimea no longer being Russian. Um uh, to uh, to justify going in there and grabbing it. Then he got greedy and decided, well, why not Eastern Ukraine too? That's got a lot of Russian uh, ethnic Russians. Of course, most of those ethnic Russians wanted to stay part of Ukraine. Um, they were only able to grab half the Donbass. That's it, two uh, provinces out there that were highly industrialized during the uh, Soviet period and were still <coughs> doing a lot of uh, manufacturing and, and coal mining and, and things like that. Uh, so that the Ukrainians uh, mobilized as the Russians held, thought they could not were not capable of and stopped the war, uh, you know, the uh, the proxy wars where the Russians were, were fighting. They had Russian soldiers in there wearing non-Russian uniforms or Russian uniforms without any insignia uh, and, and basically hiring a whole bunch of uh, uh, Ukrainians, well, you know, Ukrainian uh, Russian extraction and Russians, period. Uh, to become uh, in, uh, separatist rebels, as they're described. But it was basically an old Russian operation. But basically, uh, after about a year, it was stopped in its tracks, and, and the front line has been pretty stable ever since. But the, uh, that, in, that brought down on them economic sanctions from the West. 
Uh, and that made them even more dependent upon China, which is slowly gobbling up the Far East, you know, with trade and, 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 send, and Chinese uh, migrants, legal and mostly illegal. Uh, and so the, the, the situation got worse. And of course, as Austin has pointed out, you know, uh, Putin's trying to uh, paint a shiny picture of a mess he created. You know, he didn't have to, you know, uh, to go to war, so to speak, with NATO and, and especially with Ukraine. Uh, as un, as distasteful as that the Ukrainian situation was with uh, Crimea and all that, uh, it, it's a lot worse now. And it's not likely to get any better because they haven't got the military clout. They haven't got enough troops to invade Ukraine. The Ukrainians know it. The Americans know it. The Russians know it. Uh, but they can threaten. They can basically keep the, uh, the non-war going in eastern Ukraine, well, for as long as they want to. But it's costing them several billion dollars a year because they basically are responsible for the civilian population who stayed there. Now, many of them got out, but many of them didn't. Uh, look, look, look they, it's also costing them blood. It's real slow. Yeah. The, 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 the bleeding. You know, they can't hide the deaths in contemporary Russia as, as they could when they were uh, uh, this difference between now and even 1987 or 88, the uh, tail end of the Soviet Union. People talk. There's uh, uh, Internet yeah, chatter. You know. Yeah, they, they did pass a law making it illegal to uh, uh, disclose Russian casualties anywhere. But as Austin points out, it gets out. Anytime a, a Russian is killed in Syria, you know, the local media picks it up. It get it makes the world news. And they can't deny it because there are there are funerals back home. They ship the bodies back home. There's there's none of this this uh, conspiracy theory business is always, you know, the uh, the hidden bed. The bodies are never, you know, discovered etc. No, no. They in order to maintain morale for the military in general, they've got to send the bodies home. What they're but they have been using a lot more of are the military contractors, the Wagner Group. And these are ex-military. They're more expensive, but they don't cause as much of a stink when they get killed. Uh, but they, they can't afford a lot of those because, again, they haven't got the money. So it's all about the money. You know, as the old saying goes, in intelligence analysis, even with Islamic terrorists, follow the money. That's, for example, why ISIL is still considered so dangerous, because there's several hundred million dollars that is missing uh, that, you know, ISIL had. And, and what we've been trying to find out, we I'm meaning the United States, the, uh, the, the, banking, the banking investigators, the, uh, uh, the intelligence agencies, is how much of that money the, the ISIL actually has access to. And that's something we also cover in strategy page. Uh, uh, I suspect that a lot of it is being stolen by, uh, you know, key fingered ISIL, you know, operatives. Uh, this has always been a big problem. I mean, in communist in uh, Islamic terrorist organizations, when we first started capturing a lot of, well, in 2001 and 2002, when we captured a lot of Taliban and, and uh, Al Qaeda documents, because we overran a lot of their camps and what have you, they weren't able to destroy all their, their documents. Same thing when we, when we killed, um, Osama bin Laden in, in, in Pakistan in 2011, we captured a lot of documents. Same thing when we got Baghdadi uh, last year in, in Syria, uh, documents were captured. Uh, and, they, and one thing that they always find in those documents is uh, corruption. It's a problem even among Islamic uh, you know, terrorists. So the big question is, you know, who, where is the ISIL money? As long as they might have it, they're a threat. But at the same time, ISIL, you know, keeps, uh, you know, running extortion and other local rackets. So but be that as it may. Russia is part of the international banking system because they have to, you know, even though they, are, they have a lot of um, uh, sanctions on them, they're still doing some trade. They sell their oil and what have you. Uh, so you can't follow the money, so to speak. Uh, they haven't got it. Uh, uh, the major incentive for, uh, for Putin to crack down on the corruption it's because there's less money available to steal, so everything that gets stolen is some is less money he has to play with in the military or whatever. Uh, so you know that's it's a bizarre way to run an anti-corruption campaign, but you know it sort of works. Uh, but there is that that's the basic problem. And another problem that's coming up, uh, it's probably a decade or more away, but it's getting very close. Is the small you know modular reactors? Now these are small reactors, nuclear uh, energy reactors that are basically built 
to be fail safe. I know that's a word that people shudder when they hear it related to uh, nuclear energy. But the small uh, reactors do actually a- 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 address all the the emergency situations. Uh, they don't use engine motors for you know pumps and what have you. They use natural convection. That's why they're small reactors and what have you. Uh, they don't always use water for cooling and what have you. And if if they if they get into a runaway condition, they just boom, they shut down. And they've tested this many times. There's there's many uh, companies uh, in Japan, in Russia, uh, Canada, the United States, in Europe that are building you know prototypes of these. Some of them are already operational, uh, and uh, they can basically produce from you know 10 to 100 uh, megawatts in most cases some of them can be scaled up again with the safety is still intact up to a couple hundred uh, megawatts it, once these hit the market oil is going to be even less uh, of, a, of an asset Jim Jim wasn't there a prototype though of a thorium uh, yeah let's call it mini, uh, uh, mini reactor in the 1960s I, th- well, I think I think that's right uh, it's, for it's some pet- reason it's been around theory theoretically but again, there were a lot of little technical angles. Right, yeah. you're right. I mean, the the site up in Idaho, up in Arco, uh, yeah. they had developed uh, back in the '90s a reactor that was fail safe. So the part, basically, what it would do is if it went into a critical state or pre-critical state, a runaway state, it would actually fall apart. So that yeah. the uh, mass, the nuclear uh, mass, was apart from each other, so it didn't cause uh, any nuclear reaction anymore. The, yeah. There's, there's also I, I saw this about. Uh, no, actually, it's, it was uh, over two decades ago. Uh, talking about the kind of uh, barrier defenses you, you might have, or uh, re- rather easy to build for some of these smaller, uh, uh, smaller uh, nuclear uh, facilities. I mean, uh, no, they wouldn't take a, a, a nuclear bomb, but b- built around them, they would take a pretty heavy. Uh, uh, joint uh, direct attack munition. I won't say they'd be able to blow off a 2,000 pound bomb putting them on it, but the the uh, uh, bunkering uh, for uh, some of these uh, smaller reactor uh, designs, uh, it's actually be, the uh, cost very cost cost effective because the reactors are so much less expensive and the the sites are so they're they're not as massive as the classic fission. Uh, nuclear reactors. There's a, a, a lot of positive, uh, positive. Yeah, a lot of the designs basically had the, the reactor uh, component actually built into like a missile silo for for all intents and purposes. That's underground, and all you got above ground is a small building. Well, it, that's that's it, Jim. It, that's it, part. Thanks for uh, pointing that out. That's part of the way that the, the, the bunkering design yeah. I saw, even though they had the, the top. Imagine something that's you know like a huge. Uh, uh, Bunker itself on top, and then the rest is sunk down the uh, down the silo. Yeah, and 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 actually, <coughs> the, the SMRs are actually uh, less expensive to maintain. You know, they require less staff. I mean, there's there's nothing to monitor. You turn it on, it generates electricity. If it gets no problem, it shuts down, and you got to call in the people with diagnostics, what have you, figure out what went wrong. Uh, and one of the things that since these things have been around, you know, since the sixties and seventies, or as, as uh, 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 as was mentioned, the uh, the Utah operation has been working on it since the nineties. Uh, the uh, the work in the last few decades has to been improve the efficiency and the safety. And at this point, the the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States is actually uh, licensing, you know, designs, and and that's a and that's a pre uh, prelude. To uh, fast, uh, how should I put it, uh, approval of operating um, reactors. And see, that's the goal because the biggest problem with the the, the conventional uh, nuclear power plants is the, especially in the West, the United States, where we haven't built one since what? Uh, when was that? 1980s. Uh, the uh, uh, is the regulations. You know, the concern about the safety one, have you. So they're really pushing the safety on these small ones. Um, And uh, 
that, as I say, in a, a decade or so, you're going to start seeing them come online. And once people are, are comfortable, you know, with the, with the safety measures and what have you, uh, once the media finds out this isn't easy pickings on a slow news day, um, bingo, they're going to proliferate. And like I say, that's going to, you know, uh, uh, knock that crap out of the, uh, the, the price of oil again. So countries depending upon oil income uh, as a uh, as a mainstay of their economy are in big trouble. And Russia is the biggest, you know, victim because they have, uh, you know, since the uh, since the 70s, 80s, when the uh, world price of oil uh, sh- uh, shot up, uh, it was oil revenue that was keeping the Soviet Union alive more than anything else for the last two decades, 70s and 80s, uh, because the rest of the economy was right down in the, t- in the toilet. And of course, in the West, the people were, uh, were still saying, oh, it's a superior form of government, the this superior <laughs> economic system. But once once the empire fell apart and people were able to go in there, it was a jerk for a while, it was a journalist field day, because they oh my God, they got this pollution, they got this, they got that, they got no roads, they got no housing, they got no this, uh, they can't manufacture, you know, consumer goods. Uh, and, you know, uh, but now it's coming back, you know, that, you know, let's have socialism. Somehow we'll make it work this time. But the, uh, the, the point is you need the, the new technology and you need it working and working well. I mean, for example, the Russians were also working on SMRs and they've actually had some operational, <clears throat> but they're less efficient. I don't know about safety. Uh, they, they've been able to produce SMRs that produce five or 10 megawatts, which is, you know, not really like, cost effective but they they want like to be first like their the COVID-19 virus uh it's it's you know they basically just declared it available before it actually was it hasn't been tested etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's the thing that makes people wary of Russian technology uh but these technologies do eventually come about I mean the, the concepts behind fracking were known decades you know before it actually became economic uh, and fe- economically feasible. Uh, so eventually, these technologies do catch on. Uh, people are, are are basically disillusioned by the media, who says something in a laboratory is going to tomorrow, but it doesn't work that way. But that's not news, you know. That's a that's a boring story, and uh, and no media, you know, can attract eyeballs or, or or use it for clickbait because it doesn't work. Right, and and today they're saying socialism will work tomorrow. Because we'll do it right this time. Yeah. Right, yeah. Dan, could I suggest something? This is something I I actually should have run by you guys uh, before doing it on the program. But as many of our listeners know, we've been doing uh, a a lot of strategy talks about uh, Jim's uh, career in war game design uh, simulations and also uh, uh, analysis. And we've we've talked about a lot of games. Jim and, and I both done and and al nofi as well really scenario analysis for uh various uh u.s uh defense organizations al prime primarily for the u.s navy and uh i what was it four and a half years i really got the job thanks to thanks to dunnigan uh i was uh worked in andy marshall's um office of net assessments as a as a special consultant in strategic wargaming and one of the things i thought we might do and i think it applies here in this discussion about russia is a scenario and here's one that i i, I wanted to bring up jim talks about what a terrible and, and it talks about we, we we've got all the evidence to show what what russia's military situation is in terms of, as I, as, as I put it, being able to project, uh, pr- project power. Yet they still have. They're all, all my, tell me what you think of this comparison, Jim. <laughs> You're almost back to a czarist army because they've got enough local power that if they wanted to go bust uh, across the border, I mean a real break across the Ukrainian border or in, in the Belarus, like, they can do it with almost like a, a, a massive wave but how far will it go? And that's why I call this, Dan, it's just something to think about, and I'm going to prepare to destroy why, uh, why I don't think it'll happen. But the Russians do have the local and even regional capability to launch uh, an armored, mechanized lurch that could roll over half of eastern Ukraine, definitely could move into Belarus and uh, back up whatever government they want backed up. In, uh, uh, in Minsk, the NATO uh, is not prepared to deal with it. Uh, NATO has no 
real commitments to uh, to Ukraine. NATO has commitments to the Balts and uh, and Poland, so they're right there. And the, the temperature is going to go up, particularly in 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 Poland, the Balts, Finland, and 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 the rest of Western Europe and Russia, which is already heavily sanctioned. I mean, I got to say this: Donald Trump is the worst friend Vladimir Putin's ever had. Uh, you, know, you look at the uh, sanctions that the U.S. has Im- uh, imposed and the regimen on uh, on the uh, on the Kremlin. Uh, they would put themselves in a huge uh, financial and uh, political sanctions bind. But when Jim says they have the ability to threaten, this I think is the scenario that they are are, are threatening. Also, they've got the, the, the saying NATO wants to take Kaliningrad. Now we've written about this. I even did a column on it a few years ago. Kaliningrad, it's what used to be Königsberg, <clears throat> where uh, in uh, as a Prussian city, but it was a uh, uh, re- Kremlin rewarded itself with uh, keeping Kaliningrad. On the Baltic, uh, on the Baltic Sea, it nestles right by Lithuania, uh, 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 as as its as its reward. It's an exclave. It's Russian territory, and they're that's it's heavily militarized. They have uh, nuclear weapons in there now. Uh, uh, but one time they claimed they didn't, but uh, now, now they uh, they tout the fact that they do, and it's really. Uh, their major naval base on the Baltic, Saint Petersburg has one too. But this is uh, this is one that they uh, uh, this is this is one of their crown jewels. An extension of the lurch would be that they were go- we're going to go uh, all the way to make sure that we have land uh, contact with Kaliningrad. However, to do that, they'd have to go through uh, uh, NATO territory. So I don't think that's going to uh, going to happen. But I reason I'm talking about the alert scenario is that is the threat. And Jim, you can disagree with me, but I think that's the threat, the implicit threat that Putin has when he rattles the sabers, that and a nuclear strike of some uh, of some sort, because uh, there is the nuclear saber that uh, shake at the Turks and to shake, <coughs> excuse me, shake at NATO uh, uh, and uh, uh, and the Chinese uh, 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 as well. But that's that would be the scenario. Could the Russians pull it off? Yeah, they can scrape together seven or eight mechanized divisions, which is what I think it takes. So I'll just toss that out. There's our little game analysis. Any okay. Comments on it? Yeah. What, what do you think, Jim? Uh, yeah, although I, I think that's optimistic how many troops they could put together. They've only got about 100,000 of their million man uh, armed forces who are uh, regulars who they can deploy, airborne, air assault. Uh, they have a couple of armored brigades and mechanized brigades, uh, which are mainly stationed around you know Moscow and, and Leningrad, uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, and we've, we've, done, we've written on that, you know, they... The limited number of brigades, armored combat brigades, they, they like everybody else, we started it, the Chinese did it, the Russians did it, everybody else is doing it. Instead of divisions, they got these, uh, you know, uh, combat brigades. Uh, and um, uh, they have they have about, you know, 20 or 30 of them, uh, you know, which gives you, you know, seven or eight divisions. But that's the entire army, and most of them are not really in any shape because they still rely uh, a lot on conscripts who are in for, I think it's one year now. Uh, so they're even less useful than they were, you know, when they were in two or three years. No, uh, not, not my seven to eight, eight divisions and the numbers, oh, look, that's 70 to 80,000 troops, I, I think, uh, uh, on it. But overall point, what do they support it with? That's another one of the... Yeah, well, yeah, they, 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 no support. But, you know, actually the... Uh, uh, Back, I guess it was oh, maybe 10, 12, no, more, yeah, the last 20 years, the American army is larger than the Russian army. Uh, the Russian army is only about 380,000 uh, troops. And the rest of it's rocket forces, Navy, Air Force, uh, you know, uh, general support, etc. cetera. Uh, and um, they basically weren't able to afford or, or attract enough uh, volunteers the the goal was a volunteer army. They saw the West, you know, the British did it first in the 50s and then the United States in the 70s and everybody else basically fell in line. Uh, but uh, it requires, you know, the ability to attract your locals. And there is such a bad taste, as it were, uh, about the military among Russians 
uh, that, you know, they, they can't get the people don't see the military, even with decent pay and what have you. They've been building housing and what have you. Um, uh, they simply can't attract the people. Now, contractors are another story, but they work on short term contracts. You know, three months, boom, I'm gone. I take my money and run. Uh, uh, and that's even more expensive, and they can't afford this either, obviously. So they have a serious problem in putting together, you know, any troops for a strike, as it were, against anyone. Uh, because, remember, they have to cover the all of Russia. Now, they have some paramilitary, you know, the police, not, not as much as they had during the Soviet period. Uh, and these can, these can deal with riots and what have you. But if there's any insurrection or any you know, serious armed resistance, uh, they have to rely on the 100 or so thousand airborne air assault, uh, you know, Spetsnaz and what have you, you know, forces. So as a practical matter, you know, against Georgia uh, and various, maybe the maybe the, the Baltic states. Uh, yeah, they could put together a strike force. But again, they tried to do it on the cheap in eastern Ukraine. They again threatened. They moved a lot of uh, uh, brigades up to the Ukrainian border. But it turns out when the, the Ukrainians who have plenty of you know contacts as were informants inside Russia or just tourists going over there and taking pictures, they realized that a lot of these brigades were paper brigades, that they had a lot of conscripts. They weren't up to strength. Uh, they had most of their equipment. But again, they had nobody to maintain it, much less operate it. Uh, so, you know, again, you know, the, the tradition of Colonel Potemkin and his, and his, and his fake villages along the, the, uh, what the, the Volga to, to, uh, to, uh, basically the sea foreign visitors about how prosperous Russia was, uh, uh, you know, it's still alive and well, but it doesn't work as long as, as much as it did in the 18th century. Well, I think that's right. a good place to end. We're, we're out of time, uh, like. We often are. And uh, we'll, I, I think, uh, Austin, this is a good experiment and we can pick it up uh, with other things uh, later on. I, I, want, I want all the listeners to understand, not making a prediction. No. What we're doing is talking through a scenario, though, that I, I, I believe, and, and Jim no, knows this too, it's not believe. This is what, what the scenario that Putin threatens that we're actually because we've got the the power to do it but you see the thing is is when we talk about it okay that's what they're that's what they're using as their uh, uh, as their threat and they could that's why i call it a lurch you lurch and then oh no uh you're not able to follow through for a lot of reasons so, right which it's a, it's a, it's instructive and also something to, to, to ex- explore about i will add this i think this is something that the polls see as a threat, which is why they're eventually going to have four modern NATO-type uh, mechanized divisions. That and the F-35, they think they'll be be able to uh, to hold. Now, that's that's uh, a statement that's still ten years away from them having those. But that's that's part of their actual building plan. You know, is, is to get up to that, and the and the heavy divisions are armed with uh, 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 Abrams Abrams tanks uh, right. of uh, of some vintage. So uh, we'll wrap it up there. Just let everybody know that it's been following our Wargaming History series. We are doing it next week. Uh, There won't be two weeks in between episodes. We'll be uh, doing that one next week. And so listen in to hear uh, which should be an entertaining episode because we're going to talk about the Friday Night Follies at SPI along with some other stuff. So we'll see you guys uh, next week. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.